Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Go Big or Go Home. I am old man Troy, joined by the spectacular youngster, Kevin Cunningham, a.k.a. Kid Cunny on Twitter. What's shaking in the boondocks today, my friend? I'd say my hips are shaking, Troy. My hips are always shaking. I, I like dancing around. Um, so I'll, I'll go with my hips. I, I have you're dancing. Around. You're dancing just like, the, you know, March Madness. Big dance. Everybody calls That's it that. True. That's like yep. perfect. You're, you're like shaking, and it's like a perfect prelude to our background <laughs> music today. Shake it uh-huh. off. We'll shake it off by Taylor Swift. I mean, <laughs> I figured in the beginning of the show, I have to add a little music to the background. Why not? But we got a great show today, youngster. A lot of stuff going on in college, too. Not only in the Big Ten. So this is kind of the beginning. Not only Big Ten. I know we're go big or go home. But two big coaching hires today at programs. I mean, Louisville, a mid-scandal. They've named a coach. Chris Mack from Xavier is heading to Louisville. And then Pitt, they hired away the top assistant, I guess considered the top assistant in the ACC, Capel from Duke. And I already kind of shared my thoughts in our pregame about that. We'll get more in-depth on this show. And then we're going to talk about a couple of players in the Big Ten that are contemplating the NBA draft. And then, of course, there are still teams playing. Believe it or not, Penn State still alive in the NIT. I know it's the other tournament, as I air quote, the other tournament. But Penn State playing well. And Michigan has punched their ticket to the Final Four. So, man, youngster, we got a lot of stuff on today's show. Better have yep. some beverages to drink to keep your mouth ready to keep rocking and rolling. I've got, I've got a little bit of Gatorade. I've got a little bit of water. I'm all set. I'm going to turn it over to you. Let's talk about these two coaching jobs that have now filled two of the 43 that have been open this year, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, uh, we talked about that in the pregame, as you like to call it. Um, about all the different hires or all the different opportunities that are out there, and I'm not 100% sure of how many D1 schools there are right now. There's probably, I don't know, 300. But so if 40 of them are open, I mean, <laughs> that's, you know, that's more than an eighth of the schools out there are looking for a head coach. I mean, that's crazy, you know. Um, but so Chris Mack to Louisville, like you said, um, from Xavier, and he played at Xavier. Uh, which I didn't know uh, before the show, but played at Xavier, uh, coached at Xavier for, he was an assistant for five, six years, then he's been a coach for basically 10. Um, Obviously did extremely well at Xavier. Um, You know, uh, just from them moving to, well, I guess uh, even in the Atlantic 10, when he started 26 wins, 24 wins, 23 wins, um, they were actually going down. Um, in terms of wins, then they moved to the Big East and they went up to 21 to 23, 28 and six a couple of years ago, uh, or three years ago, I guess, um, 24 and 14 um, this past year, and then 29 and six this year. Uh, best record there. They made a, or sorry, first four. Um, they made an Elite Eight last year, um, got a one seed this year, only made it to the second round before being bounced by Florida State. Florida State was on a roll. Uh, and obviously we're going to talk a little more about Florida State as Michigan clamped down defensively as they have done basically all season um, to end Florida State's run. But, yeah, Chris Mack uh, going from Xavier to Louisville. To me it's interesting just because you think of Xavier in the Big East. They're constantly pushing. It seems like uh, – I, I mean, he – I'll say this, that Chris Mack in his, what is it, uh, nine seasons at Xavier – um, only once has he missed the NCAA tournament, and every single season, all of those eight seasons, he's at least gotten to the second round. Um, he's got three Sweet 16s. He's got an Elite Eight. He hasn't made that breakthrough to the Final Four, but that whole argument about not being able to win the big one or get to the Final Four is just stupid, in my opinion. Honestly, if you're constantly going to the second round, Sweet 16, making an Elite Eight appearance, what, you think all of a sudden Chris Mack just stops being able to know how to coach and all of a sudden he just can't get there? Kind of like Gonzaga's Mark Few, kind of like uh, Villanova's, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, but the Villanova coach, it's like, oh, yeah, his team just always loses early. 
And now, like, in their last <laughs> 12 NCAA tournament games, they're, like, 11-1. and one. Um, You know, they lost last year, and then they won a couple years ago. Um, and now they're back in the Final Four. They're one of the favorites. So it, it's just, to me, Jay Rice's his name. Um, it, to me, it's just kind of dumb, <laughs> honestly. Uh, a, a player, maybe, let's say, in the, in the playoffs, um, and you see his averages completely dip and his shooting percentage maybe completely dip in the postseason when he gets against Tufts competition in a seven-game series in the NBA or something, that I guess I can buy more than a coach all of a sudden just choking in the Elite Eight round or Sweet 16 round or Final Four or championship game, not able to win the big one. I, I don't understand that, <laughs> that whole argument. I don't know about you, Troy. I, I think this move, though, in general, um, going to my point, Xavier – Seems to be on top of the Big East constantly now, always going to at least the second round, seemingly getting at least high seeds. If they are a 7-8 seed, they'll make runs to the Sweet 16, maybe pull an upset or two. Um, he's got it rolling at Xavier. And so to go to Louisville, to me, it's like, I guess it's an upgrade in terms of Big East to ACC, I guess. Um, but as a whole, I don't know. You're already rolling in the Big East, and you just got a one seed. <laughs> in the Big East. Um, so why move to Louisville is kind of my assumption. I, I Again, I guess it's a step up. Um, but say Duke opens up, say a Michigan State opens up, say an Arizona opens up when Sean Miller gets fired. I You know, something like that makes more sense to me than Louisville. Maybe that's just me. Um, and you can absolutely win a title with Louisville. Um, Patino, you know, did so, not according to the NCAA. But in general, you can win a title um, I think you can win a title at Xavier, but I think you can win it a little easier at Louisville. But I was expecting Chris Mack, if he were to go anywhere eventually, that it would be a huge program um, like an Arizona type um, as opposed to a Louisville, which is like a second-tier ACC school, at least in my opinion. Maybe I'm off. I'm curious on your thoughts with that. No, I, I agree with you. I, I look at it, the only thing you get going to Louisville is you get ACC play. But you look yeah. at the program you've built and the way that Chris Mack recruits and he gets players that are in his system. And again, Kevin, this you, you look at it from this standpoint. I'm going to reference back. We do a Pittsburgh show. Jamie Dixon going to the ACC. He was in the Big East, and the school moved. Or the, yeah, the whole school moved to the ACC. Jamie Dixon did okay, but he saw the writing on the wall, and he bolted out. And, and, and I'm not saying it, that in a bad way. You're going from Xavier to Louisville. You have to go out and recruit a certain style of play now in the ACC. And Chris Mack is a good coach. But sometimes I wonder, when these coaches are you know sitting high, we, we talked about this, He's rolling at Xavier, and now you're going to go to a Louisville program, one, that may not even be able to compete in the NCAA tournament for how many years? Because they're still under investigation. There's so much scandal that went on there, and and I know that's not on him. But I'm telling you, if you go out to recruit Kevin and you're going to a kid that, let's not even say a five-star, let's say it's just a four-star recruit, and you're going in there in the next couple of years saying, well, we're not going to be able to go to the NCAA tournament. And I'll, I'll throw Pitt out there. I mean, you, you got Pitt going out after him. You got all these other ACC schools. Are they really going to want to go to a program where they can't go to the NCAA tournament? Especially if it's a good player that may only put us two years in. Are you really going to get that kid? I think... Sometimes the grass is not greener on the other side. I had to throw the cliche in there. I look at this hire, it's a little bit surprising to me. And I can't believe it's just for the money. I don't even know if the money's better. I didn't see, I didn't see a value on the contract. All I can yeah. see is that he thought this would be a better opportunity in a better conference. But you said it best. Right now, Louisville is a middle-of-the-pack ACC team. That's what they are. They're not in the upper echelon. Can Chris Mack bring them to the upper echelon? Well, 
the verdict will be out, I guess, right? We'll see. We'll see what happens when he heads down to Louisville. But sometimes the comfort when you're doing well, maybe it was getting old for him. Maybe he wanted to change. But, I mean, he was building himself as a legend at Xavier. And I agree with your comment. Could he have won a title at Xavier? Heck, he got a number one seed this year. Happened to lose in the second (laughs) round. Yeah. I mean, there's not much more. And and I say this not not in the sense to say why he left. There's not much more you need to do at Xavier now except keep putting fuel in the engine. And if you're a good coach like Chris Mack, keep fueling the engine. You had a number one seed, so now you go to your recruit and say, look, we had a number one seed. Yeah, we got knocked out in the second round, but Florida State was playing good basketball. It happens. At least we right. weren't Virginia and lose to a 16 seed. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't understand this move from a coach's perspective. Being a former coach, I don't understand yeah. it. I I told you when I look at coaching opportunities, what's the opportunity at Louisville against the Dukes and the North Carolinas and the Virginias? Maybe it's that ego to say, I want to build that program into an upper echelon, but there's so much baggage at Louisville right now, Kevin. I don't like this job. I mean, that's just my thought. And I, I don't think it's a bad hire. I think Louisville got a great hire in Chris Mack. I'm just yeah. trying to figure out what Chris Mack was thinking taking right. this job. So there's my thought. I, I, hopefully that, that gave you some insight as to my thoughts. Yeah. I want to mention, too, um, with this thing, that, and you mentioned the recruiting thing, and to me it's different on the level in the sense that Louisville is going to go after the four stars and five stars. Not that Xavier didn't. Xavier just didn't get. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if Chris Mack ever got a five-star. I don't know if he ever even tried, to be honest. Um, there has been some really good players at Xavier, and especially guys that have turned into you know juniors, seniors, and left for the NBA. I mean, he's had NBA guys there. He's had really good guards um, over the past few years, especially, and they always seem to have a really good big man um, in the middle. Um, not to say that he's you know dominant, top five pick, but they always seem to have a really good team. Um, not that they're absolutely dominant and littered with, you know, again, lottery picks, but he he always has an NBA guy at Xavier, um, whether it's a guard in the making or a big or whatever. But so at Louisville, you're not only recruiting maybe, um, you know, all four stars, but some five stars as well because it's Louisville um, and what Louisville is. You know, Louisville expects not necessarily national title after national title, but it basically, it's at least my assumption is national title or bust. I don't think Louisville fans are happy going to a Final Four and losing. I think it's cool. I mean, it's like me as a Duke fan, it's cool to go to a Final Four, but literally, honestly, Troy, as a Duke fan, you, you win the national title or it's a bust of a season. And it's not to say that Coach K, K this season, for instance, did a terrible job because they went to the Elite Eight and lost to Kansas in overtime. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I'm massively disappointed. You know, I fully respect what Coach K did this year and the run they had. But basically, in the end, it was a failure of a season in the sense that Duke didn't win a national title. That's just, (laughs) that's the expectation. Um, Maybe that's unrealistic, but I almost assume that it's the same way at Louisville, and I don't necessarily think it should be. Um, But they're basically held to high standards. But so the other thing with recruiting is that you can go to a kid and his mom can be sitting there and it's like, yeah, you know, we're under these sanctions. Um, You know, I came to this program under the assumption that we're not going to miss NCAA tournaments in the future. You know, maybe he can even sell that card, but in the end, the mom can, can step in and say, your program's the one that recruited girls to go there to basically have a brothel on campus. You gave scholarships to girls to entice basketball recruits to go there. Not you personally, but the university. This happened at your university. That's why you took this job is because there was an opening because this happened. I want my son to go there, to go to a brothel campus, basically is what the mom can say. Absolutely. So why would that five-star kid, why would his mom say, yeah, you know, I'm 100% in support of this? Not that it's the mom's decision, but 
<laughs> a mom has some weight under an 18 year old kid's mind as to where they're going to go to college. So especially when it's something like this, it's not even as though, you know, they paid one player 50 grand to go there once. And so the head coach got caught and he's fired. It, this is a brothel. I mean, it's embarrassing if you're selling your program to a kid's mom, in my opinion. Um, so the recruiting is going to be more difficult. I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, again, you're playing in the ACC, so it's a better league in general, but you just got a one seed in the Big East. You cannot set your team up better than that. You can't. There's nothing better you can do, whether you're in the Pac-12, Big Ten, ACC, whether you're Duke, whatever. Chris Mack did a better job at Xavier in the regular season than Coach K did at Duke because Coach K and Duke got a two seed. Xavier got a one. So statistically, you're going to have the easiest route. You're going to have the best chance of making the Final Four, win the national title, more one seeds, do it than any other seed. That's just statistics. So you can't set yourself up better than what Chris Mack did. So this move in general, I'm with you, Troy. I don't really understand it. Um, The other one we wanted to get to and maybe (laughs) not talk uh, 15 minutes on, um, but Duke's assistant coach, Jeff Capel, um, he was kind of the guy in waiting, um, associate head coach. I know Coach K had missed a few games over the last few years, and Jeff Capel stepped in as the head coach um, and did fine. But he moved uh, the top assistant to Duke um, for the last, what was it, uh, eight seasons, I think, seven, eight seasons, made the move to Pitt. And Pitt, um, now has the top assistant, arguably, in college basketball, you can um, argue for. And I know, Troy, <laughs> you've got your opinions on this, um, and I'll let, you, I'll let you start with this one. Yeah, I mean, this will be his third go-round. Third go-round. He was at VCU, and then he was at Oklahoma. I mentioned it to you. You look at Oklahoma and Pitt, to me, very similar programs as to where they're at in their respective conferences. Oklahoma, Big 12, Pitt, ACC – Middle of the pack teams. Nine seasons as a coach, 96 and 69, Kevin. 96 and 69. If you're Pitt, I I know it's probably an upgrade from Stallings. This guy can recruit. I mean, he's the top recruiter at Duke. He's the top assistant, right? He's the guy that's evaluating talent. He's the guy doing a lot of the visits, doing those things. Coach K just has to put his stamp of approval on it. But I'm sure his recommendations are like, hey, coach, we need this guy. But you have to remember, he's now going to pit. To go get the one-and-done guy, not bringing that kid to pit. I'm sorry. Why would that kid want to go to pit when he could go to Duke or North Carolina? Why? At this point, he's not going to. So I, I want pit fans that are all excited about this hire. It's great. You got a good hire. I'm not, I'm not cutting that down. But don't expect the NCAA tournament next year. Don't expect it the year after. Maybe three years. The guy's got to recruit. And he's not going to go out next year and get five stars. He may not even get four stars. He may get a four star in there and say, look what we want to build. And I hope he does well. I mean, I live out here. I want pit basketball to do well. But I got some reservations. The other thing is, the only reason that he had to leave Oklahoma, he got fired, Kevin. He got fired. Now, he wasn't supposedly the one that did it. His assistant coach, improper sanctions to a player. And you know my thoughts on this. There's there's two sides to this. One is, you knew what was going on in your program. And if you didn't, the other side of that coin, if you didn't, shame on you. You shouldn't be coaching. And I go back to my coaching day. And to be honest, Kevin, basketball program, soccer program, there's more guys in a soccer program. More guys in a soccer program. I kept tabs on all 29 guys that I had. I basically knew what was going on. I knew what was going on with my assistants. I knew what was going on with my work-study people. I knew what was going on in my program. 29 bodies, players, just players. You put all the other bodies in, probably in the mid-30s. 
Basketball a lot smaller. So you're telling me he didn't know this was happening? BS. He knew what was happening. I'm not saying he's going to bring it to Pitt, but I'm just saying I got some reservations when I see things like that because he either knew or didn't know. And either way to me is a bad thing. If you didn't know, you better tighten up the reins. And maybe he did going to to be with Coach K. Now, X's and O's, recruiting, I think he's got it all. But it didn't equate to his other nine seasons in the NCAA, Kevin. Three tournament appearances in nine years, and he had this guy named Blake Griffin when he went to the Elite Eight with Oklahoma. So he can recruit. But 92 and 69? Ah. I mean, it, we'll see how it equates to Pitt. That's all I got. I could keep going on. I know we want to get to the Big Ten stuff. We want to try to keep this show relatively short. And by short, we usually mean an hour and a half. That's about our show for Big Ten. But, you know, Kevin, I just I threw some stuff out. I'm not saying it, it's a bad hire. I just do have some reservations about whether or not this guy can succeed at Pitt because he didn't. I mean, I guess he did succeed at Oklahoma, got him to an Elite Eight. But if you're a Pitt fan, I just went over the numbers. Nine seasons in the NCAA, three tournament appearances. His jobs that he had, to me, are very similar to Pitt, and now you're in the ACC. So how many NCAA tournament bids are you going to get? You may not get zero wins in the conference next year. You may get a couple. That would be great. But if you're hoping right now that this guy is going to be the guy that brings you to elite status in the ACC, I don't think so. And I, and based on his prior experience, and now again, he could have learned at Duke, but history is telling me he's not going to get you to the NC tournament year in and year out. What are your thoughts, youngster? You're a Dukey. You're a Dukey fan. So I'm sure you love this, and you're going to say all positive things. Let the Pitt fans know how great it's going to be in Pitt. <laughs> well, I think they can win a national title next year. I'll start with that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but Jeff Cable, seriously, I I have a ton of respect for him and for what he did at Duke because I think that, and I guess I have to bring up Duke records, um, so I will before his time, but I think that this is when all this one and done um, really, in my opinion, started, um, was kind of when he went over to Duke. Um, I, I'm very curious to see Duke's records um, before he went there because I know that there were times when Duke wasn't ranked, um, and I believe that was right before Capel. Um, there, Duke was not doing fantastic when Calipari, I think, first went to Kentucky and was starting this one-and-done thing and taking all the best recruits and sort of lose, losing Duke in the mud. Not to say that Duke couldn't have, you know, senior-laden teams and compete for, you know, and win national titles. Um, But in general, just, I guess to me, they won a national title in 2010. Duke did. Um, Cable goes there in 2011. And to me, it's like that 2010 team before that, you had to go back nine years um, until Duke won another. Uh, They were just kind of struggling, in my opinion. Um, I, I think that as a whole, I, I guess I'm very curious to see right now. Uh, they went, I guess, let's see, 2011 um, is when he left. And so Duke, yeah, that, that national title team won 35 games. The year before, it was 30. Um, but the year before that, 28. The year before that, 22. The year before that, they did really well, 32. And then 27. Um, they were just kind of, to me, they were um, not being a... I guess blue blood and going deep in the tournament. And I, I'm just looking right now and I'm seeing, you know, sweet 16, sweet 16, final four, sweet 16, sweet 16, first round, second round, sweet 16, and then national champions. Um, just to me, I, I don't know. You, you expect Duke to do better. You expect Duke to not win 22 games. You expect Duke to not go eight and eight in the ACC, um, 11 and five. I, I just think that once he got there, he really helped propel Coach K into thinking, we're Duke. We can get number one seeds whenever we want. We can get the number one player in the country whenever we want. 
Duke for next year has the top three recruits in college basketball. Literally the top three. Number one, number two, number three, going to Duke. But it's Duke, That's Kevin. I understand where you're going with this. Yeah. But it's Duke. Right. Okay, now he's got to recruit at Pitt. Right. And there, there's a big difference, and I need to bring this up. Pitt is an urban campus. And what I mean by that is it's locked dead center in Pittsburgh. So you're going to a city. You're not. And to me, I'm just saying you're talking about two different things for recruiting here, Kevin. The guy's good. And I understand his philosophy. I don't know if it'll work at Pitt. I don't know if he's getting top recruits to come to Pitt. He's going to have to be really good at coaching to be able to, to swallow his ego in the first couple of years and be satisfied with maybe some three- and four-star recruits. I don't think he's bringing five stars to Pitt right away. I just yeah. don't believe that. So mm-hmm. that's why, where my reservation is. Can he get it done and string together a couple of NCAA tournament appearances then – that recruiting that you're talking about, top players in the country, maybe. You're still talking about Pitt. And are you going to finagle those guys away from a Duke, a North Carolina? I don't know. I really don't know. And I'm not saying it's an easy job to, to get a top recruit to go to Duke. But look at what you have to sell there, Kevin. Coach K, the history, where we're going, what we got going on. There's a lot to sell. What are you selling at Pitt? Hey, we were 0-18, we 19 if you count the tournament. 0-19 in the ACC, but I'm going to turn yeah. it around. I, if, I, if I'm a five-star, I'm like, yeah, thanks, Coach, but no thanks. I, I don't want to do all that work. I want to go somewhere yeah. like Duke, and I want to be guaranteed a 1 or a 2C. So I wanted to throw that in there, Kevin. You make a valid point, but I'm just not buying it. I'm just – I'm not because of what he has to do early on in that program. He, he doesn't have anything solidified. He's taking over a crap hole right now. I, I would have used different language, but this is a family show. He's taking over a crap hole right now. And he's yeah. got to be a darn good coach. That's all I got. Yeah, um, I I 100% agree with you, and I don't think that he is going to pull five star after five star. Not even year one, year two, year three, uh, but down the line, I I don't necessarily think he's going to build this unbelievable <laughs> recruiting hotbed like he did at Duke. Because again, Coach K wasn't necessarily doing that. Um, all these guys who have been top five picks recently, it's all <laughs> not all, but he was the main recruiter. For Duke, and again, like you're saying, it's different. It's Pitt. It's not Duke. But so to go back to Oklahoma and to say, you know, hey, let's get a top five recruit in Blake Blake Griffin and get 30 wins at Oklahoma and make it to the Elite Eight. I mean, before that, I I just kind of had to laugh because it's like, okay, this guy gets this one recruit who's really good, and suddenly Oklahoma's going to be great. Well, they were. That one season that Blake Griffin was there, you win 30 games, you go to the Elite Eight. But that was that's a heck of a job um, to get a recruit like that to go to Oklahoma at the time. I was like, that's weird. <laughs> it's like, okay, is he getting paid? Because it, it, it was just weird. I mean, that's like today, the number four recruit in the country going to Iowa State because um, Iowa State's been down a little bit, and you're seeing like around 500 play. You know, maybe win 20 games. Um, it's just kind of a joke. And so for Iowa State to get to the number four kid in the country, it's like, huh? <laughs> so, you know, to me, for him to be able to do that at Oklahoma randomly one year, um, that means something to me. I, I think that it will be flash in the pans like that, though, for Pitt. I think that's, that's how I'll leave it, is that expectation-wise, no, don't expect him to turn them into Duke. Don't expect him to get Pitt rolling into ones and two seeds consistently, even five, ten years down the line if he makes it that far. I don't think that's going to be the case. I just think he has the recruiting ability. Well, they gave him get... seven years, youngster. They gave him seven yeah. years, right? So he's got seven years to do it. <laughs> Supposedly. I'm, I'm, I'm being totally sarcastic. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think that's how it's going to go is that you're going to, this is going to be kind of like what Thad Mata was at Ohio state where you'll get a really good recruiting class once in a while and you'll make it to a final four potentially, um, once every seven years and hopefully you cash in and win a title then. Um, but in general, your average year at Pitt with Capel, I expect it to be what 23 and 10. Um, make it to the NCAA tournament, get bounced in the first or second round. I think that's going to be your average year. But if he can compile one top 10 recruit and, you know, a couple four stars to go alongside him, and you can get some of these guys, some of these four stars to build in the program and stay three, four years, it, that's when Pitt will have consistent, you know, sweet 16 level teams that can break through to a final four and win the whole thing potentially at best. I think that's possible. Um, but consistently, 23 and 10, first round, second round exit. Uh, around 7 to 10 seeds, 11 seeds, I, I think that's going to be the norm. That's what I would expect. I don't expect him to fully transform it into Duke and getting five stars left and right. I don't. I'm not you know, delusional. But I think he can do it because he did it at Oklahoma randomly one season, in his third season, after Oklahoma went 23 and 12. And that was their best record in a while <laughs> at that point. So I, I think he's a good coach. I don't, I'm not expecting him to be phenomenal coaching. I expect him to be a good coach. I expect his recruiting to do as well as you can at Pitt. Because I think he really transformed Duke into what they are today, getting constantly you know, number one picks in the draft and top five recruits and the top three recruits in the country. You're not going to get that at Pitt because it's Pitt compared to Duke, obviously. But – if you want a recruiter to get it done at Pitt, this is your hire. And coaching-wise, like you said, three NCAA tournament appearances in nine years, I don't think he's fantastic <laughs> coaching. And maybe he has obviously learned things at Duke over the last you know, seven, eight years. I'm sure he has. But I think you're getting a good coach who's a dynamite recruiter, and you're going to get the best recruits you can at Pitt. So don't expect the world. But if he can get things rolling and make a Final Four once every two full recruiting classes, I think that's all you can ask for at Pitt. I think you can't ask for more than that because it is Pitt, and that's fine. But you have to look yourself in the mirror if you're a Pitt fan and understand that we're not Duke. We're not North Carolina. So to go to a Final Four once every five years, once every eight years, and knock on the door for a national title, you have to be content with that because you're Pitt. Just like my Tennessee Titans, I, I don't expect them to win, you know, go to a Super Bowl every four years. I expect it to be once every 10, 12 years, and hopefully you win one. You know, I, I don't expect Patriot level, you know, dominance for 10, 15 years. That's just being a Tennessee Titans fan. That's just being an Iowa Hawkeyes fan in the Big Ten. That's just being a Pitt Panthers fan in the ACC right now. You have to get those flash in the pan recruiting classes and I think he can do it um, but don't expect more because it, it's just unrealistic at Pitt. Let's move on youngster I think we've pretty much beaten that into the ground now let's yeah. move into some <laughs> exciting Big Ten stuff Penn State this is a team that you and I thought was NCAA worthy before the season started put themselves behind the eight ball started playing better basketball at the end of the year I know people say this is the other tournament, the other tournament. But, heck, the other tournament for Penn State, they're rolling right, right along. They've got a big game. We're recording this on Tuesday. They're playing tonight, Kevin. They're still alive. Their season has been extended. There's only, what, eight teams left in the country that are playing Four. right now? Well, oh, four in for the NCAA yeah. and then four in the yeah. NIT. There's yep. eight teams that in Division One. I, I should say that, Division One. Eight teams in Division One that are still able to say they can play basketball. I My hat's off to Penn State. We kind of talked about this before the tournament started, that we thought Penn State was going to go out with something to prove and they were a good team, and they've done it. I'm happy for Penn State doing a Big Ten show, if you're a Big Ten fan, yeah, it is the NIT, but you know what? 
They're winning. Penn State's winning. And I'm happy for the seniors on that team. And hopefully they can finish it off. Hopefully they can keep rolling along. NIT championship, I know people say, well, that's a consolation. Okay, it is, but they got to play more basketball. And guys on that team, heck, this is their last, some for some, it's their last go around for the younger guys. It's great experience. I'm happy for Penn State. If they can take it all the way to an NIT championship. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they are only doing right now what they can, and that's just winning. <laughs> I mean, you beat Temple, who's very average, um, in the first round. Then you knock off Notre Dame, who is with their best player. To me, that was an NCAA tournament team. Then you beat Marquette, who's scoring 1,000 points a game. You just beat them in the Elite Eight, 85 to 80. Um, it, Penn State's winning. <laughs> um, they've lost to Purdue, I guess, a few games ago in the Big Ten tournament. Uh, that, that's it. I mean, then you have to go back a couple more games uh, at Nebraska. And Nebraska was a fine team this year, obviously, winning 13 Big Ten games. They were good. They lost to Mississippi State, a four seed, and Mississippi State now is <laughs> in the Final Four of the NIT playing Penn State. So Mississippi State could knock off both Big Ten participants in the NIT potentially. Um, if that happens, we'll have, we'll have a uh, team to hate, I guess, next year <laughs> for this show, Mississippi State, very random. Um, but Penn State plays Mississippi State, like you said, tonight, March 27th on a Tuesday, and then the NIT championship is Thursday night on ESPN2 for those listening uh, to get in time to tune in for that one. If Penn State's playing, if not, then I don't, I, I won't watch it, <laughs> to, be, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, I don't know but, why they do it on a Thursday night. I don't yeah. know why they – I know why they can't do it on the weekend. I mean, that's the NCAA. Right. It, right. But they could have done it on Friday night. Yep. Thursday night. What a weird night. You you yep. would have thought maybe a Friday night. Yep. But, even you know, it, Even Sunday. The yeah, Final Four could. is – uh, Saturday, and then the championship game is Monday. So Sunday. Is yeah, about. they could have done it right and sandwiched it right in between, but no. Yep. They do it on Thursday. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess just poor management. You know, you it yeah. would have been in my mind. The and now we're getting way off on other subjects, which we do all the time. To do it on Thursday, like we just talked about, do the do the uh, semifinal on Thursday. Or Friday, do Friday Sunday. You only right. want to give them that day rest. Do Friday Sunday, just kind of piggyback off the NCAA. Yeah. Now I I, I know the NCAA pride. Maybe there's a stipulation. I don't know. But if I'm the NIT, I'm trying to get as much viewership because people do rate that as the the consolation bracket that you're not good enough to get in the NCAA. But there are some good teams in there, not great oh, yeah. teams, but good competition. And, hey, good for Penn State, but it is what it is playing on a Thursday night. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to mention my last thing. I, I'm not going to break down Penn State, Mississippi State. Um, like you said, Troy, could Penn State win the whole thing? Absolutely. Um, you just want to look at the last four teams remaining, and it's number four seed Penn State. There are only eight seeds um, to be given in this tournament. It's 32 teams, not 64. So there's four regions with eight teams in each region, not 16 teams in each region. Um, so the worst seed is an eight seed. But Penn State's a four. They're in. Western or Mississippi State is also a four seed. On the other side, Western Kentucky is a four seed. <laughs> there's three four seeds in the final four here. And then Utah is a number two seed. Yeah, Utah is not phenomenal. I'll just say that right now. They won 19 games in the regular season. So <laughs> Penn State... To me, I, I personally, I don't know anything about Utah other than seeing that they're 1911 in front of me on the screen. I would expect Penn State, not expect, but I, I, if I had to pick one team to win it, I would pick Penn State. I'll put it that way. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens here. Uh, Penn State's obviously trying in this tournament because I think you mentioned it before, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that some teams just look at this as, well, we're not good enough for the NCAA. Who cares? doesn't matter. <laughs> We're in the NIT. Who cares? Um, and so that's how some of these games are decided. Obviously, all these teams are trying wholeheartedly to win the title. 
um, which is cool because, like I said, there is good competition all over this field. You know, the next 32 teams, you can pick out a ton of teams who could easily beat teams like Xavier in the in the NCAA tournament. Obviously, if UMBC can beat Virginia, teams like Penn State, Notre Dame, Mississippi State can beat Virginia. <laughs> you know, these teams are all capable. Um, that's why they're in this tournament. Um, but so, yeah, I, I just thought it was curious, interesting to see three four seeds here and a two seed in the final four. Yeah, I'm, it's one of those things that you, you look at the NIT and people, again, will say it's the consolation, but they're still good teams. And there were some teams. We talked about Nebraska. We think Nebraska was probably sulking that they didn't make the NCAA tournament, and it showed. They got bounced right away. Whereas Penn State was playing good basketball, they wanted to prove something, and boom, good for them. Another team that's ready to prove something, Kevin, Michigan. Team that, I mean, we talked about them during the year, but I think nationally, not a lot of attention again this year, and we both said on this show, almost a cookie cutter of last year. Just kind of plod along, plod along, boom, look at us in the Big Ten tournament. No, boom, look at us in the NCAA tournament. We're going to go win some games. And Michigan, I'll tell you what, Kevin, here they are in the Final Four. The matchup, people are pretty much, I think people are ink-penning them into the final against Loyola. You got to give Loyola some credit. You don't just show up in a Final Four. I mean, look at the road that they've had to take. They've had to play some good games, close games. I know they got Sister Jean over there, but, man, the way Michigan's playing, I'm not putting them in in pen, but I've got them penciled in the final, Kevin. Michigan's a good team. I don't think they're going to overlook Loyola in a final four. I mean, Michigan has been well-tested. I know the Big Ten was down, so-called in talent, but now, you know, Penn State proving, look, we're a good team. We're in the NIT final four. Michigan was in the upper part. They weren't, in, they weren't at the Purdue-Michigan State level, but we talked about that second tier. They were right there on the top of that second tier. Michigan yeah. is a good team, and the thing is they play such good defense. And I finally heard it on the game. I finally heard it in the Elite Eight, somebody finally giving props to Michigan's defense. They play great defense. Everybody thinks they can just score. But Michigan plays great defense, and that leads to their offensive efficiency. But, man, they're darn good defensively. I like Michigan's chances to get to the final, Kevin. What about you? Yeah. I, would you mind if we switched to Purdue first? Oh, go ahead. You can go ahead. I just figured that was a good segue for me to say Michigan's got something to prove, too. Yeah, I I hear you. I guess the other thing I wanted to mention too before getting to Michigan um, and their road and what you know uh, that's how we'll I, I guess close the show. Um, Purdue uh, last time we talked on this show they were playing Texas Tech in the Sweet 16. They lost 78-65. Um, not to say they didn't show up. Texas Tech just played better um, in general. I'm not going to go over the game entirely, but. As a whole, this Purdue team was obviously missing Isaac Haas. Um, the students, I think we mentioned in last week's show, were trying to create a brace that the NCAA would allow for Haas to play. Um, it, he was sorely missed. Uh, he's a 7-2 guy with a really good offensive game, which is weird to find in the NBA, let alone college basketball. Um, I, I think Purdue could have beaten anyone and win the, won the whole thing. Honestly, if Haas was healthy, I, I picked them in the final four, we're going to see Villanova. Um, you know, for those who haven't seen Villanova much, they're not dominant inside. And I think Purdue could have won the rebounding battle, not necessarily fairly easily, but I think they would have won the rebounding battle and been a very tough out for anybody. Um, but so it, it just goes to show that one injury <laughs> to any of these teams can be a devastating blow um, for any of these teams. You know, take out the number one difference maker or the top post guy or the top guard on any of these teams. And it's just like, you're kind of screwed. 
<laughs> to win six straight games or five straight games after that injury happened. Um, it's tough because you play tough competition very early in this tournament, um, whether it's the first round, second round, or, you know, get all the way to the Sweet 16, whatever. Um, but so Purdue's season in general, I, I thought it was a great one. It, it just sucked that <laughs> Isaac Haas got hurt and fractured his elbow. Um, that's, that's really all. Um, do you want to save NBA draft stuff, Troy, for after Michigan, or do you want to go into that now? Yeah, let, let's save it for after since I already gave a little yeah. little tidbit on yeah, Michigan. Yeah. And I just want to throw in here uh, the Purdue thing. Um, I had him in the final four of my bracket. That was, of course, before the Haas injury. Uh, that team, you know, I know that they were struggling at times at the end of the season, but they would proven in that first 75% of the season how good they really were. And, you know, we thought, we said it, we thought the rest would actually do Purdue good to maybe get away from the grind of the Big Ten, you know, every other day or every, you know, four days playing a, against Big Ten competition. They were in a little lull. And for them, I thought that rest really mattered. And then Haas has to go and get hurt. And they still went pretty deep. And not as deep as I thought they were going to go. But they were as good as any team when Haas was healthy. And, you, you know, unfortunately, injuries are part of the game. I know that's another cliche that I'm throwing out there. But, you know, this is a guy that he was a difference maker when on the court. But Purdue played good team basketball, had a great run, unfortunately had to end a little bit sooner than they would have liked. And now you got Villanova. It's funny, Kevin, we were talking on – was it on this show about the madness? Yeah, we were talking about the madness last week of the upsets. Now all of a sudden you look at the right side of the bracket and you got two number ones in the final four. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> two number <laughs> ones and number three, and then your Cinderella. Yeah. yeah, which is about normal for right. a NCAA tournament. A couple number ones, then a high seed in there, and then your Cinderella in the final four. It's the way that the, the way that the script has worked every year for the past couple of years. But yeah. what are your what are your quick thoughts on Michigan? I know I gave mine. So let's talk about Michigan and then let's talk about a couple players that are dancing with the idea of going to the NBA. Dancing, I like that, Troy. Um last sixteen games that this Michigan team has played. I did it on social media. Follow our show for those still listening at Youngster Old Man. We post all of our podcasts that we do. We do four shows usually weekly. Have some um, confidence, Youngster. Have some confidence. Everybody listens all the way to the end. Come that's on true. now. We're, Very true. we're we, good. We see the numbers. Yes. Yeah, we're, we, we're good. We see They're the numbers. Um, but so at, at Youngster Old Man, all one word on Twitter, me, myself, is at Kid Cunning on Twitter, Troy at Troy Robert 967. Uh, follow us on Twitter. That's where we do all of our polls, all of our questions, all of our uh, shows that are recorded, and we save them and we get them out there on Twitter. So again, at Youngster Old Man on Twitter, all one word. But so I'll say it again on this show, like I did a week ago, like I did two weeks ago, like I have on Twitter. Last 16 games now for Michigan's defense. These are the points allowed that Michigan has given up. 47, 73 in overtime. 52, 72. That's 72, big number, no overtime. That's huge. You know, that, that's like an average college basketball score, but they allowed 72. Then 59, 62, 63, 61, 71, which was in overtime. 58, 64, 66, 47, 63, 72, no overtime. Wow, oh, my God. And then 54 in the Elite Eight. I mean, that's the last 16 games. You're seeing games in the 40s, the 50s, low 60s. You'll see the occasional 73-71, which are in overtime, <laughs> and then you got a couple 72s sprinkled in there. This team, just, this team hasn't given up 73 points in regulation since at Purdue in January. Hey, Kevin, did uh, Virginia and Michigan swap uniforms? I mean, you yeah. you look at the defensive numbers, you would think that's a Virginia-type defense. Everybody was so high on Virginia's defense, and Michigan's is just as good in my mind. I'm looking, I'm looking right now, Troy, as you were saying that, and they gave up 77 to LSU the fourth game of the year. 
I'm counting games they gave up at least 73 in regulation, not counting overtime. One to LSU in November. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at their whole, their whole season here. No, North Carolina at North Carolina in November, that's two. They gave up at least 73 points. I'm still looking here at Purdue, like I mentioned in January. That's number three. Uh, that's it. Three times this entire season that they've given up 73 points. In Did regulation. you say that that LSU game was that at LSU? That was a neutral site game. Neutral I think that was site. out of the country. <laughs> it might have been out of the so country. So you got neutral, neutral site, and they gave up over 73 on the road where the home team is yeah. playing in the lovely confines of their backyard. Yep. That's pretty amazing. That's just amazing yeah. to me. 73 points in regular, I mean, that's, that's your average team. Your average team scores 73 points. That's, that's not high. That's not that, – that's average. And Michigan did Heck, it. Heck, I they think gave even up. the Wisconsin Badgers scored 67 a game, <laughs> Kevin. And you know how much I love that Badger offense. But I think they scored like 66 or 67 a game. The Badgers did. And they were porous. So I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah, no, I, I'm looking it up right now. Wisconsin scored well, 64 in conference play, 66. I mean, it, teams that scored 73, Nebraska was at 72. Um, Maryland was 73. Indiana was basically 72. Minnesota scored 75 points a game this year. Illinois scored 75. Iowa scored 79. To give up 73 is just, it's, it's whatever. I mean, it, it's not much at all. Um, so three times in, how many games did they play? 39? That's insane. That's, that's insane. 73 points in regulation or more. Three times in 39 games. That's absurd. Um, so they, I mean, they were 17-6 and six. since then, 15-1. and one. I mean, you can't get much. They're playing great basketball, especially defensively. When they only score 61 against Montana, they hold them to 47. When they only score 64 to Houston, they only they hold them to 63. When you only score 58 in the Elite Eight game, you still hold the opposition to 54. I mean, Big Ten tournament, 71 to Iowa in overtime, and then Nebraska, 58. Michigan State, 64. Purdue, 66. Healthy. Healthy Purdue, 66 points. I mean, it's insane. <laughs> this Michigan defense uh, does not get the credit they deserve. Like you said, Troy, it was interesting to actually hear Michigan's defense get credit in the Elite Eight game. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I respect the heck out of Loyola Chicago. I picked them to upset Miami in the first round and then lose to Tennessee. They beat Tennessee by one. Then in the next round, they beat Nevada by one. And then they went on and beat Kansas State like I figured they would, not by 16 points, but they did beat them by 16 points. Um, Loyola Chicago is a very good mid-major team. That's why they were an 11 seed. That's why they weren't a 13, 14, 15, 16. You're, you, I, I believe they only lost five games this season. Um, so it's a really good senior guard-laden team. It, it's, it's a very good mid-major team. Um, in my opinion, they could win the whole thing. I really don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. I think they're that good. I think that Kansas Villanova aren't that fantastic, unbelievable, you know, teams. I expect Michigan to go on and win. I do. Um, they're favored by, it's like five points, basically, five, five and a half. I expect Michigan to win the game. I expect Villanova to beat Kansas. Um, but as a whole, I mean, if Michigan doesn't shoot well and Loyola Chicago hits a few more threes than they do and they win 69-67, I, I fully understand that. And I wouldn't bash Michigan at all. Again, you don't just get into the Final Four from luck or by happenstance or by Sister Jean. You have to be a good team <laughs> to make a Final Four. Um, so this is a really good mid-major team who in one 40-minute game absolutely can beat Michigan, absolutely can beat Kansas, absolutely can beat Villanova in one game, for sure. So I think this team that Michigan's going up against is not going to ever go away. I don't think Michigan's going to blow them out. 
Michigan's got to play one of those games like they did in the Sweet 16 against Texas A&M where they're just hitting everything, and then their defense is also their defense. So they win by 27 points. It, otherwise, I don't expect Loyola Chicago. I don't expect this game to be a double-digit game. I expect it to be fairly close throughout. I think Michigan should hold the lead for most of it. They're the more talented team. You've got bigs who can step out and create mismatches, and your guards are really good, just like Loyola Chicago's. But Michigan's talent, it, it's it's better than Loyola Chicago's. But Loyola Chicago has senior guards, and they're not going to just fold over and die and you know, be crap. So I expect Michigan to win, um, but nothing would surprise me in this Final Four that, you know, just like any Final Four. But nothing should yeah, nothing surprising on that left side. I mean, if Loyola wins, so let's put it this way. You know I love underdogs, Kevin, but in this case, yep. I have to shun cheering for the underdog because we do a Big Ten show. I, my loyalty <laughs> lies in the Big Ten now. It really does. We've been doing this show for over a year. I'm Big Ten through and through. I'm cheering for Penn State. I'm cheering for Michigan. I grew up in Big Ten country. I know you didn't. I, I mean, you went to school. You spent time in Wisconsin in Big Ten country. That's yep. not where you were born. You were down in the, the nice, wonderful confines of the Sunshine State. <laughs> Me? I grew up in Big Ten country. Now I do a Big Ten show. I am through and through. Go Michigan. I want Michigan to win the title. I want Penn State to win the NIT title. Bam! What a great show that will be next week if that happens. Well, we, yeah, we're, you know what? We're going to wait to do the show next Tuesday because we've got to yeah. watch the championship game. Yeah. Oh, uh, I guess unless Michigan would happen to lose. But I don't think right. we're going to. But l- like you said, and I mentioned it too. People already penned Michigan in the final. Don't do that. Slow down, Turbos. Slow down. Because Kevin gave you every reason why Loyola is going to hang in this game, and I truly believe they're going to. Yeah. I thought, you know, when I looked at it, I'll, I'll put it this way, Kevin. Florida State, ACC, Loyola, Chicago. I actually think Loyola is a better team than Florida State. I, I think that. So look at the problems that Michigan had with Florida State because they couldn't score. Now, defensively, I'm not worried about Michigan. They're going to stymie Loyola, but Loyola is not going to go away. And like you said, they hit a couple threes, stay in the game or get the lead, they're going to put some pressure on Michigan. But at the end of the day, I think Michigan's defense and their talent will overtake Loyola. That five, what is it, five and a half spread is the, on the game? I like that, yeah. I think that's fair. I think that's a yeah. fair line for this game. And people, you know, people are probably looking at, oh, five and a half of Loyola, Michigan against Loyola. You really need to look at Loyola. I th- and I'm saying it right now on the show, I think they're a better team than Florida State. And Florida State stymied Michigan offensively for a little bit. It's going to be close. I don't even know if Michigan will cover the five or five and a half, whatever it is. I think it's going to be close, but I think Michigan wins at the end of the day. Let's move on, Kevin. What a great show so far. Now we'll talk. I want to mention, talk, Troy, yeah. I want to okay. mention the other one, too. Um, but also I, I want to mention, too, with this matchup, uh, just Loyola Chicago in general, they beat Miami by two for a reason. They beat Tennessee by one for a reason. They beat Nevada by one for a reason. Because you've got a bunch of senior guards, and you've got five guys who average double-digit points. You know, this team's not <laughs> crap. They're, they're team. not inexperienced and in getting lucky. Exactly. They're, they're a very good old team. They're a team. And yep. we go back to it. You had talked about before uh, Capel went to Duke, Coach K was actually old school four years, built teams, yeah. junior, senior, laden teams, right? Right. Well, that's what mid-majors have to do because they're not getting the one and dones, They're not getting NBA talent. And when you play together for four years, you mold as a team. And that's what Loyola is. They're a good team. And like you said, they're not going to wave the white flag. They don't need Sister Jean. And Sister Jean, nothing against you. If you'd happen to listen to the show, nothing against (laughs) you, but they don't need you. They're a good team. They are a good team. They step on the court, they play basketball, 
like you said, Kevin, any of those five get the ball in their hand, they're going to execute what is expected of them as a team. There is no ball hog. There is no ego. They are a good basketball team, and that's why Michigan better be ready to play because they're going to go out and they're going to play for 40 minutes. And in that case, they're going to give Michigan a game. But, again, I think they win. So we can move on to some NBA draft stuff unless you got anything else to add there, youngster. Villanova, Kansas, who do you like? Um, and I guess, do you think, I, how far do you think Michigan goes? Would you expect Michigan to beat Villanova and Kansas? Would you expect Villanova or Kansas to beat Michigan? What do you, how do you think it plays out, I guess, quickly? Well, I, I've already said that I think Michigan will win, so that puts them in the final. Yeah. You know, so should they get there, I think Villanova uh, has enough. I think the experience uh, that they, they bring in uh, with that team I think it's going to be a doozy of a game, Villanova-Kansas. I think it really is. But I think Villanova will pull that off. The guard play from Villanova, I mean, either Villanova or Kansas are capable of of winning. But I'm just going back to the old adage, defense wins championships, Kevin. And Michigan proved that they don't need offensively to put up 80 to half to win. Whereas I think a Kansas or a Villanova, if they're offensively struggling, I think they have some deficiencies on defense. So let me put it this way. If Michigan has a porous offensive night against a Villanova or a Kansas, I think they lose. I think Michigan has to be average to better than average offensively in a championship game to win. But defensively, I just think they're too good. I think Michigan wins this all. I'm so excited. And that's because I'm an old school guy, Kevin. I know you millennials like these 85, 90 point games. If the championship game ended 60 to 57, I, I'd be in my glory. Then I can finally just go to everybody, see what defense does. Play good defense and see what it does. Reap the rewards of good defense. And that's what I think Michigan has. So I, I think Michigan wins it all, Kevin. I think they can beat either Villanova or Kansas. I think Villanova does take down Kansas. But I think Michigan against Villanova, Villanova will probably want to go a little fast tempo against Michigan because if you get Michigan in a half-court set defensively, I think Michigan wins that battle nine out of ten times. You're going to score. But I think Michigan, when you're setting up half-court offense, their defense is too good. They, if they slow that game down, if that game is slow for Villanova, no chance for Villanova. If it's a little faster pace game, uh, Villanova has a chance, but we've also seen it. If Michigan is on offensively, they can play up tempo. That's what I like about Michigan. They can play the slow it down, grind it out game. They did it against Florida State. Or you get into this game when their offense is clicking, they'll be like, okay, let's score 85. We'll play with you. Well, watch us. We'll play right with you, basket for basket. Michigan's good enough to do either of those. But I like Michigan. That's all I got. I'm with you. I, I want to mention this, too, before we get to the NBA stuff. Um, well, I guess I, I'll say this, that Michigan, I'm with you. I think they beat Loyola Chicago, like I mentioned. I think that Villanova is the more talented team. I don't think this Kansas team, I, I'm upset that Duke lost to Kansas, honestly. Uh, the 2-3 zone gave up way too many open threes, and Malik Newman, the transfer from Mich- Mississippi State, who was a monster recruit, transferred to Kansas and scored like 20-something points and hit like seven threes. Um, that's how Kansas really stayed in the game um, throughout and then pushed it over time, eventually won the game. I'm upset as a Duke fan, honestly, because I know Duke's the more talented team. I know this Kansas team isn't as talented as Bill Self has had before. Not to say that they can't win the whole thing. They can but I don't think this is one of those dynamite Kansas teams that it's like, yeah, this team should win the whole thing. <laughs> like, I thought that after the first couple rounds a year ago. Like, man, this Kansas team is just really good. They eventually lost, but that was a really good Kansas team a year ago. This one I just don't think is as good, honestly. Um, but so I, I expect Villanova to win um, that game. Again, I could see anything happening in this Final Four, but I expect Villanova to win. I expect Michigan-Villanova. And I just think Villanova, your top two rebounders are 6'9". And you've got another guard in there. I guess 
your uh, two of your top three guys are six nine. Your second leading rebounder on this team, Mikael Bridgers. I love him. He's a wing player, um, probably a three at the next level, but he also is second on the team in rebounding. He's like six 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 seven. Uh, this is not a big Villanova team. They don't even have that staple, like 6'10", 6'11", guy who's just really good defensively and active and can move up and down the court and is just a really good college big. They just have a couple 6'9", guys. I mean, they're, they're not that intimidating on the interior. Like I mentioned, if Purdue played them, I gave the edge to Purdue. I picked Purdue to beat Villanova in the Elite Eight because of that reason. So I don't think Michigan's getting hammered on the glass when they play Villanova. I think they've got as good, better a defense than Villanova does. I think Villanova has a better point guard than Jalen Brunson. I think Villanova has arguably the most talented two players, arguably, in Brunson, the point guard. He's fantastic. I've loved Brunson since coming out of high school. Um, But Mikhail Bridge is also on the wing. Two very talented guys from Villanova that could lead them to a title very easily. Um, But Michigan's defense as a whole, I think that's going to be the difference. I'm with you, Troy. I think Michigan beats Villanova in the title game, not to say that I'm biased at all, (laughs) but I really do like Michigan's chances going forward because I don't think this Villanova team is as good as they were two years ago when they won it. I don't think this Kansas team is as good as they were a year ago when they didn't win the whole thing. (laughs) So I like where Michigan's at. I love that they're not fantastic on the interior, but neither is Kansas or Villanova. So I think it matches up perfectly for Michigan. Um, to go against a Duke where they're huge inside with NBA talent left and right, that could be an issue. Miss Michigan State, a ton of talent on the inside. They're big. That could be an issue. But these two teams, these three teams that are left against Michigan, I, I like Michigan. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, we saw this in 2014 when UConn, a seven seed, won the national title. And they came out of nowhere because they were a seventh seed. <laughs> they were the first seventh seed to win the national title. In 2014, that was with Shabazz Napier, who has been, you know, a, a bleh NBA player. But him and there was another guard um, on that team that just defensively, they won the national title for Connecticut that season. Just those two guards on the perimeter defensively, just completely locked up opposing teams as guards and just made their offense difficult to get into in the NCAA tournament. It, that's all they did was they just pressured your guards, forced you into tough shots, forced you into turnovers, sped you up. And that was it. Nobody could do anything. Their first game, I had to look it up obviously, but UConn in the first game of the tournament give up 81 points that year in overtime in an overtime game. They survived that. They played number two Villanova in the second round, gave up 65. Then, whoa, in Sweet 16, they gave up 76. They still scored 81 because they had players that could score, just like Michigan. But the last three games, the Elite Eight, they gave up 54 points. Final Four, 53 points. Championship game, 54 points. <laughs> Elite Eight on, 54, 53, 54. It, their defense just completely locked up. And that's exactly how I can see Michigan winning this tournament. Because the last 16 games... The entire season, they've only given up 73 points in regulation three times in 39 games. Their defense is insane. That Connecticut defense in 2014 is what led a seven seed to win the national title. It can be done today. (laughs) Defense can just lead you the entire way. Happened in 2014. I almost expect it to happen this year because of how the matchups play out. So I like Michigan going forward, Troy. Um, But the next couple uh, next few minutes, I guess, will be spent on a couple players. Carson Edwards from Purdue has acknowledged, I believe, it was either over the weekend or on Monday, I believe it was over the weekend, that he would test the NBA waters in terms of going to the combine and doing all those drills and stuff, but not hiring an agent. That's the report, is that he's not going to hire an agent. Well, he hasn't hired an agent. Um, but the report is he's going to test the waters and come back to Purdue. They're just going to, he's going to go there, do some drills, do some testing, talk to NBA people and ask them basically, hey, what do I need to do to improve my game? Here's my game right now as it is. Where would I go in the draft right now? And then take that knowledge, come back to Purdue for his junior season. Kata Bates G up, different story at Ohio State, Big Ten Player of the Year, wing, top 30 recruit at the time for Thad Mana. So Chris Holtman brought him in. 
He is now a junior. He becomes Big Ten Player of the Year. He has already said that he is going to sign an agent. So he is basically full-fledged. He's ready to go. To the NBA, the report out there with Carson Edwards from Purdue, the guard, is that he plans on going to the combine and doing stuff, but then coming back, he's not hiring an agent. I'm curious on your thoughts with both of those guys, Troy. Well, you look at it, the easy one is, yeah, time time to go. For Well, I'll start with Edwards. Edwards, I, I like it. I wish more. I wish more players would do that. But yeah. you get these pl- you get these players that are so egotistical. Like I'm ready for the NBA. I'm going to go tear it up. I'm going to be the next LeBron James. Come on, let's be real. You, you look at the NBA draft, Kevin. Not a lot of. I mean, not many players get drafted. One. So if you're drafted, you're in a special class alone. Being able to go in and play in, I call it, remember, I call it the Pretender League. What do they call it now? The G League? Is that what it is? You got it. You got, you, you got players that are struggling they, just to play in that league. For me to see Edwards go and say, look, I know I'm pretty good, but I want to go see what the NBA thinks. Everybody always thinks they're better than what they really are. The media will make them better than what they really are. Sometimes right. coaches make players better than they really are. To get it from a third party, to get it right from the mouth of NBA scouts, that is valuable knowledge. And to say, look, I don't need an agent. I don't need you to market me. I don't need you to go talk to teams for me. I want to go see how I can be a better player. I I think a lot of players should do that. Just go do it. Maybe the NBA should think about doing like a a postseason camp for these guys that are, I'm air quoting, NBA talents. Just put together a little camp, like a mini combine or a, uh, I don't want to call it a fake combine because it would be a real one, but, but do that and have another one for those that have declared, like, okay, these are the guys. Because I do think right. for NBA teams, you know, you want to know what you're looking at. Am I looking at a player that's going to be ready for the draft or a guy uh, that's going to go back to school? And I think there's enough time and there's enough resources to do both. So I'm cool with that. I actually applaud him. And, you know, don't hire an agent. I'd like to see you in college again next year because I think he's a phenomenal player. Then you flip the table, yeah, what else do you got to prove there, right? Big Ten player of the year, yeah, you're NBA ready. Go do it. Declare, go sign your agent, have him market you, go talk to teams. You know, that's, there's two sides of the coin here, right? You got a guy that, you know, is going to be a, a pick in the NBA, probably ready for the NBA. I mean, but you never know. I mean, look at it, Kevin. You, you said it. These drafts are always like lotteries. They're just lottery tickets. You don't know what they're going to do at the next level. You know, were you a man among boys in the Big Ten? Eh, kind of. Not always, but most of the time. Yeah, will you have a good NBA career? Yeah, I think so. Will you be a dominating all-star? Nah, I'm not sure if that'll happen. But I think a solid NBA player, in my mind. What do you think? I'm done. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm i with you. I Based you up, I think he's, uh, the issue is he's, uh, what is he? I think he's six, seven. I want to say. I'll look it up right now. Um, but so uh, he's more of a, I guess, forward. Yeah, he's six, seven. Um, to me, he plays kind of a four um, for Ohio State, and he's you know seen as a mismatch in terms of length and being big and you know taking bigs at the collegiate level to the outside. Um, and yeah, that you mismatch. just mentioned the great word right there, youngster, at the collegiate level. He right. put him into the NBA, and he's just another guy on the court. Right. I mean, that's why I said he was a man among boys in college. But you get to the NBA, you're just – like the other guys that are on the floor. So he's got to develop his game. And that's why I said, can he be a good NBA player? Yeah. But to me, there's a difference here. What more is he going to develop in college? Because it is a mismatch, right? So unless he's out there trying to change the way he plays the college game, what can he really work on? I mean, you can work on your shot and some other things, but is he really going to get that at the college level? I don't think so. On the flip side, I think Edwards can really 
do a lot while he comes back for another year. I don't know if that made any sense to you, Kevin. I just wanted to jump in there, though, because you so eloquently, there we go, I got it in this show at one time. I was waiting for it. You eloquently talked about the difference because in college, he is. He's dominating. He's a mismatch in college, but he won't be in the pros. Just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. I mean, he's just another lengthy 6'7 wing that that plays the three in the NBA. I mean, just like every other three in the NBA is 6'7, 6'8, potentially 6'9, lengthy. Um, You know, it's weird to have a KD seven foot lengthy three. Um, But almost every single NBA three small forward is 6'7, 6'8, 6'9, really long. You know, can play defense well because they're really long can hit the three, (laughs) you know. Um, So he's just, not to say that he's just going to be another guy. He's just going to, you know, be your typical, you know, seventh man off the bench, a a solid role player. He could obviously develop and be Well, if you're not going to say it, then I'll say it. He's just going to be another guy in the NBA, Kevin. Like I said, can he have a good, solid NBA career? Yeah, I believe so. But he is just going to be another guy. I'll say it. You don't have to. I will. He's just going to be another guy in the NBA. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I honestly think Carson Edwards could be really good in the NBA. Um, I, I don't think he's Damian Lillard level yet, but I think he could turn into that type. Um, I think coming back another year would help him. Like Lillard stayed four years um, at Weber State, I believe it was. So, I think Edwards coming back for his junior season, I think that's smart. Honestly, I think Kata Bates G up. I I don't know. I I think that he's going to be taken in the first round, um, late in the first round. That's my just random general assumption um, as of right now, uh, based on almost no knowledge. But so yeah, he's he's not seen as this you know top ten can't miss prospect has to come out because he can't heighten his draft stock. He can, um, but you know, to what level, um, how much more can he do? Like Caleb Swanigan, <laughs> he absolutely dominated the college game. It, there was no reason to come back um, because, yeah, he can make himself better, but he also makes himself a year older, and that's worse in NBA minds. This year, Caleb Swanigan averaging two points, Troy, <laughs> two points, one rebound. So it, life is difficult. It takes time in the NBA. It takes time for Steph Curry, Kawhi Leonard, basically everyone except LeBron. It takes Kobe even a year or two. Most people, it takes three, four, four years really until you're averaging like 15, 16 a game and you're really on the come up and you're really like, okay, this kid actually has the real potential of being really good. You can sometimes see glimmers and hopes your first and second year in the NBA, but it really takes three, four years to be like, okay, this kid's really coming on to the game. Um, it took Giannis a couple of years until it's like, yeah, this guy, this guy's going to really be really good, potentially top five um, in the game. And that's what he is already, which is insane to me. But in general, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm with you with base G up. I, I think the ceiling is up there. It's really high because of his measurables and what he can do. But to me, I'm with you. He's just another guy in the NBA, honestly. I, so, yeah. Call me a base And we're just it. two other guys sitting here talking about <laughs> Big Ten sports. Yeah. I think, I think we're all wrapped up for today. Make sure you follow us on Twitter. At Youngster Old Man is our show handle. Not only can you find the Big Ten links, you can find a couple other shows that Kevin and I do. And we do an XFL show, if you didn't know that. If you like the XFL or you're going to like the XFL, tune in. You can find that on the net also. But find us individually on Twitter also, at Troy Robert 967 That is the old man. The youngster is at Kid Cunny, K-I-D-C-U-N-I. Hope you enjoyed the show today, everybody. We'll get back at you next week talking about a Michigan championship. That's what we're going to say. And yes, sir. Penn State. And a Penn State NIT championship. Enjoy the week, everybody. We'll get back with you soon.